You may not be able to pronounce the name, but I'd be shocked if you didn't recognize the logo. A red silhouette of an arctic fox, or in Swedish, a fjallraven. You most likely associate this symbol and this brand with a particular iconic, boxy, brightly colored backpack. This thing can be seen around the world, but what a lot of people don't realize is that the Fjallraven legacy goes way beyond that simple backpack. For decades, the brand has been a pioneer in the outdoor clothing industry. And we've had a ton of requests to cover this brand, so get settled in, grab your popcorn, because we're about to embark on yet another three-part series, starting with the story of Fjallraven. As you might expect, if you have been following this channel for a while now, the outdoor clothing brand Fjallraven was started, yes, by an outdoorsman. Meet Ake Norden, who at the mere age of 14 had, quote, spent more time outdoors than indoors. Ake's unique relationship with the outdoors would lead him to build the company that you now recognize as Fjallraven. But this was back in the 1950s, and there was an issue with backpacks. The backpacks of the time were slowly being improved with wartime materials and technology, but they still kind of sucked for long treks in the woods, and that didn't work for Aki. If he was going to be spending hours and days on end in the Swedish Bergens, he wanted something that could hold his gear without giving him long-term back pain. So he stole his mom's sewing kit and his dad's tools and made his own backpack with a wooden frame that would evenly distribute the weight across his back as he walked. His self-made contraption eventually caught the eye of the indigenous Sami people who spent weeks at a time high up in the mountains. They liked it so much that they asked Aki to make them one, and then a tent, and eventually he had developed his first customer base. A full decade after that first backpack, Aki officially launched Fjallraven, which featured aluminum frame backpacks designed with the avid hiker in mind. And no, this was not the legendary Konkin pack that launched Fjallraven to the moon. That came almost two decades later. But in the meantime, Ake was expanding his product line to a variety of outdoor gear. Fjallraven rapidly gained traction and would eventually become the biggest apparel company in Scandinavia, even outstripping Nike at the time. Nike said, just do it. And then they did it and started dominating. And then they were like, just stop doing it, please. We want to sell more shoes. Now, as you probably know, the Konkin was a defining moment for the Fjallraven brand. At the time this bag was released, there was growing concern among Swedes about back pain. It seemed more and more people, and even younger children, were developing spinal problems. In typical Ake fashion, he saw the problem and he believed he could fix it. One of the prevailing ideas at the time was that kids were suffering because their backpacks only had one strap that went across their chest. So Ake partnered with the Swedish Guide and Scout Association to design a two-strap backpack that could fit everything that a school child could possibly imagine without ruining their spinal alignment. And so just in time for the 1978 school year, the Konkin was born, a product that would propel Fjallraven to international acclaim, a story that we're going to delve into in far more detail in our next video in this series, so make sure that you are subscribed, damn it! Look at me in my eyes. Have you subscribed to this channel yet? Have you drank enough water today? Have you brushed your teeth? But mostly subscribe to the channel. <laughs> As with many of the outdoor clothing brands that we've covered before, Fjallraven's success really lies in the core values of its founder that have been preserved throughout the company's history. But in this particular case, the brand values are actually more connected to Swedish culture than any one individual's ideals. Now, Sweden isn't exactly one of those countries that gets talked a lot about in the North American news cycle, unless, it is to make a comparison that makes the rest of the world look terrible. Leah, can I borrow your glasses? Yes. <clears throat> in today's news, while public school enrollment across much of the United States has reached an all-time low, Swedish children are actually increasing their intelligence to the point where they only require grade 7 education before going on to university. Sweden has recently mandated the four-hour workday so that staff get the much-needed rest that they need to relax with their families. 
all the while maintaining record level GDP and economic growth. The people of Sweden are guaranteed 25 days of holiday per year just so that they can hang out in the forest and enjoy nature. Only that last one is not a joke. There is a Swedish law that grants employees the right to 25 days of holiday a year, which can be taken in four consecutive weeks during the summer. Basically, everyone in Sweden is given the time and the opportunity to freely explore the beautiful country that they're a part of. I mean, look at this nature. You got the Vattenfalls and the Skogar and the Sjöar. Okay, I see what the writers did there, okay. Jokes aside, this connection to nature is quite literally a protected Swedish rite called Allemansraten. Allemansraten, or the right to public access. When you're in Sweden, you have the right to wander around and pick up some flowers or spend time in a forest and even pitch a tent almost anywhere as long as you're not right beside somebody's house or some kind of cultivated land. This includes private property, so even without asking permission, you can just set up shop and uh, take in the view. Unsurprisingly, Sweden is one of the most sustainable countries in the world, if not the most sustainable when it comes to issues like recycling, renewable energy, and consumption of organic food. And this is the kind of culture that Aki was born into, and the people that he was selling his products to. So it's not a huge surprise that a quality outdoor brand boomed in this part of the world where exploring and celebrating nature is legally bound into their constitution. Fjallraven makes a point to affirm these Swedish values, and they claim that their whole mission is to make the outdoors more accessible. According to them, this involves making gear in a way that respects the planet, seeing as, you know, it's kind of hard to enjoy nature if it's been totally trashed to make the jacket that you're wearing. To this end, Fjallraven has a long history of innovating when it comes to the materials used in their products. Whether that means inventing a whole new fabric or finding ways to incorporate recycled materials. They use some pretty interesting stuff to make their gear, including yarn scraps, beeswax, and wood chips. And they also have a stricter than average no nefarious chemicals policy, rivaling pretty much every other brand in the outdoor space. In our Gore-Tex video, we talked about how dependent the entire outdoor clothing industry is on hazardous materials that are ironically super bad for the planet. So it's cool to see an outdoor brand that's finding creative ways to move past this. And if you're interested in this kind of stuff, we're going to be making a full video about it in the third part of our series here. So make sure that you are subscribed. I, I promise I will not say it again. It's the last time I'll say it. But perhaps most importantly, y'all Robin products are built to last. Unlike their colorful Konkin backpacks, they have a timeless, if not overly practical aesthetic that enables them to skirt around the fashion trends of the day, but they really emphasize their durability. We've come across stories of people using their Konkin for over 30 years. Now, it should come as no surprise to anyone watching this video that we as humans have a bit of a fashion waste problem globally. Okay, okay, all right, okay, all right. It's enough slices! High quality, durable clothes that don't rely on the latest trends is a great first step to ensuring that we don't produce more than we need. Fjall Robin prides itself on these qualities, but unfortunately, Fjall Robin is not perfect. I'm so sorry, I know, you thought for a minute there that this was like the perfect blonde hair, blue eyed stereotype, didn't you? Nope, just like Swedish people's rumored fear of badgers, Fjallraven is not perfect either, but at least they're not afraid of a tiny bear. Oh, the honey badgers are just crazy. Fjallraven makes a lot of claims about caring for their workers and the planet, but they don't actually have a whole lot of backing for many of these claims. We've seen some things to indicate that they might be a reasonably ethical brand, but reviewers other than us criticize their lack of transparency and third-party certifications. Contrast them with, say, Patagonia, which is a brand that we've talked about before, which is a certified B Corporation, a fair trade company with third-party members, ensuring that their employees are treated well and that they use a sustainable supply chain. But with Fjall Robin, we mostly just have to trust them and you know, assume that they're not lying to us. This becomes tricky when Fjallraven makes products in countries like China and Vietnam. 
places that are notorious for their poor labor practices. It would be a lot easier to take those things at face value if there was some sort of external pressure to ensure that what they're saying was the truth. On the marketing side of things, Fjallraven has a campaign to save the Arctic fox, and this is used often as an example of their environmental stewardship, but the campaign feels a lot more self-interested than philanthropic. The campaign focuses completely on the Arctic fox as their icon and their namesake for the brand, which is great, but it also works conveniently as a publicity stunt, because since their wild populations have tripled over time, they get a lot of attention from that. Now, don't get me wrong, this is a great initiative, but it is very common for a company to present a solution to a problem, and it helps if this problem is very cute and endangered, to distract from other more complicated issues. When things like carbon emissions or labor practices get brought up, the Arctic Fox is a convenient place for them to point to prove their commitment. Even though we have no real proof of how much money has been contributed to this cause or where it's likely to go and get maintained in the future. This is why we look for certifications like B Corps, 1% for the planet and carbon neutral. Because at least this is some sort of guaranteed amount of money that is donated every year or some sort of validation from a third party. So can we take Fjallraven at their word? Well, the Swedish-born company has roots in something that appears to be a nature-conscious culture, but they have grown way beyond the borders of their home nation. Does their international popularity and multi-millions of dollars in revenue dilute their message when the demand and influence of others becomes inescapable? I'm not at the boardroom, so I don't know, but we hope that it's not the case. Overall, the Fjallraven brand is kind of inspiring. They don't seem to pander too much to what mainstream culture wants them to do, which we have seen many outdoor brands do in the past, and they seem to be pushing constantly towards these new kinds of innovative materials that are more sustainable for the planet. I think Fjallraven is probably a great brand to look for used secondhand or through some sort of refurbished website because they make really good quality stuff that's going to last. And especially nowadays with so much green and sustainability marketing being imbued into every single product that we buy, it's more important than ever to think critically about the products that you're buying and hopefully make an informed decision for yourself. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you're stoked on it, make sure that you're around for parts two and three. All right, we'll see you in the next one.